We talked about DNA being really um, the key, the, the, the defining aspect of, of life, right? And that all living things are composed of the same four nucleotides. We talked about DNA really being um, kind of this connecting piece between, b amongst all life, between all life forms, in that all living things um, have DNA and it's all composed of the same four nucleotides. We have adenine, cytosine, thiamine, and down here we have guanine. So these same four nucleotides make up all living things. They, they code for every gene in your body. Every one of the 20,000 or so different genes in your body are composed of these same four nucleotides. So then how is it possible? Well, it's the sequence of these nucleotides that makes different genes. It's the sequence of these different nucleotides that makes us different from other life on the planet. Okay. Humans have a tremendous amount of DNA um, in, in common, and the more closely related to us another organism is, the more similar their DNA as well. One thing that we do find is that um, throughout the different kingdoms, we have areas of highly conserved DNA. One of these in um, Kingdom Animalia is the um, sequence of DNA, the gene that codes for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the oxygen-carrying protein in your blood that, carry, that allows your red blood cells to carry oxygen throughout your body. And hemoglobin is incredibly effective at what it does. And because of that, there's a lot of evolutionary push to not mutate hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is so good the way it is, is that any small mutations from it tend to be really detrimental to the organism. And so we don't see those mutations often. Okay. When we have these highly conserved sections of DNA, these serve as really good places for us to compare genes amongst different organisms because we can tell the difference and we can tell how long organisms have been on separate evolutionary paths based on these highly conservative sections of DNA. Okay. All living things go through reproduction. All living things grow and reproduce. Reproduction, and then growth and development. Okay, you all started off as that single egg, fertilized by a sperm. Both of these different types of cells, remember um, from your freshman biology, are what we call haploid cells, meaning they only have half of the genetic information needed to make an organism. When they come together, and fertilize and a fertilized zygote develops, we now have a diploid cell. Okay? Meaning that we have two sets, die, two sets of the chromosomes that we need. So continuing on with chapter one, we want to also talk about the different domains of life. Now we organize life. It's a natural tendency for us to want to do this. It's something that you've been doing since you were a very small child. It's how we make sense of the world around us. We try to put things into different categories. For a long time, we divided things into two categories, animal and vegetable. Okay? Um, sometimes we also threw mineral in there, but that was considered non-living. Animal being kingdom animalia, but also including things like protus and, and all other types of things that would move, that would obtain energy in a very noticeable way. Um, vegetable being plants. And we discovered things like fungi and protists and things that didn't necessarily fit that scheme. And so we added to our kingdoms to include animalia, plantae, protista, and fungi. And we also had kingdom um, bacteria. Still, differences are still there. So we've really taken a, a good look at how we define life now, taken a step back, and we now prescribe to what we call the three domains of life. And the three domains of life maintains the kingdoms, modifies them so that they're better aligned, um, but adds another level of hierarchy to this. We have the three domains of life. We have domain bacteria, we have domain archaea, and domain eukarya, which is where the majority of those traditional five kingdoms ended up. Domain bacteria, again, are defined as prokaryotes. They're single-celled. 
There's a variety of different types of bacteria, very successful competitors on the planet, and they're also um, defined by having a very particular kind of cell wall. Remember that peptidoglycan cell wall. Domain archaea, on the other hand, are also prokaryotes. They're also prokaryotic. Uh, but there's some differences here. They aren't quite like bacteria. They have some things in common with eukarya. So there's this kind of proposition that perhaps there's some middle ground between. We also call these um, domain archaea our extremophiles. They live in extreme habitats. Okay, hot springs, the middle of a glacier, inside rocks. They live in places where no other life does live, so they have that nickname of extremophiles. They can be grouped into thermophiles, ones that like heat, halophiles, ones that like extreme um, salinity conditions. There's a whole variety of these different um, archaeans. Domain Eukarya is what is left of that traditional five kingdom. In there we have kingdom planti including all plants. Plants define, one of the defining characteristics is that cellulose cell wall. Not to be confused with the defining characteristic of kingdom fungi, which is the chitinous, chitinous cell wall. Um, kingdom planti is composed of autotrophs, things that can make and produce their own food, whereas kingdom fungi, these are all decomposers. These are all ones that are heterotrophs that have to consume their food from other sources, okay, are mushrooms. And they're actually much more extensive than the mushrooms you just see. The mushrooms are the part of the reproductive part of the fungi that you see above the soil. But the, the mycorrhizae, the, the tendrils of these um, different fungi, extend throughout the forest floor, throughout the soil, um, and they actually exist in symbiosis with many of the different types of um, plants in the forest, including many of the major um, and large tree types. A lot of those large trees could not get to be the size they are if they didn't have this association with mycorrhizae fungi, who are actually gathering nutrients from the soil as they're decomposing things, providing some of those nutrients to the tree in exchange for getting glucose and some other metabolic pro pro um, products from that tree itself. Kingdom Animalia is the kingdom we belong to. Um, kingdom Animalia are heterotrophs. They have to consume other food. They're defined by animal cells. No cell walls in Kingdom Animalia. And lastly, we have Protus. And notice here that Protus does not have, say kingdom in front of it. We've had to redefine what we thought of Protus for a very long time. Protus was often just this dumping ground for anything. If you didn't know what it was, you put it in Kingdom Protista. Well, Kingdom Protista is really more than one kingdom. It's not monophyletic. It's not one group. It's actually composed of several different groups that have separate evolutionary lineages. And so there are lots of different kingdoms which are within that group that we call Protus. Furthermore, we explain within that hierarchy of life we have kind of a nested order of things. And this is to really help us make sense of different organisms. Um, the largest is the domain. Right? That domain is that largest, most all-encompassing. If you remember back, Dirty King Philip came over for great spaghetti, right? There's our domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. If we go through that, the end goal of this is to come up with a single type of organism. So domain would be the largest, kingdom follows that, all the way down to species. This process by which we name different organisms was developed by Carlos Linnaeus and is called Binomial Nomenclature. Literally, the two-name naming system. And it gives every organism a very unique species and, or I'm sorry, genus, and then species name. So that by the time you get to this level, you're speaking about just a single type of organism. And this is really useful for scientists and lay people all over the world, so that when we're talking about a type of organism, no matter what language we speak or where we're found, we can be determined that we're speaking about the same thing. Genus is always capitalized, species is always lowercase, um, and if they're not in italics, you must underline a genus and species um, name and binomial nomenclature. One of the other themes of AP Biology is this interconnectedness in life. And I put this, I include this diagram in here because I think it's a really good example of how life and systems are really interconnected. 
it's very easy for us to think about, um, if we think about a cell itself, the nucleus containing the DNA, sending out the messenger RNA, sending it to the ribosomes, making the protein, the protein going into the ER, then going into the Golgi, and then out to do its work. Well, as it turns out, that cell is much more interconnected than that. Um, and this is an example of a systems map that's showing all of the different proteins and products that are being produced and how they're interacting with each other. So it's not just this linear progression. Often one metabolic process sets up a chain reaction and affects many other processes in the cell. And if we expand our vision of that, not only does it set off chain reactions within the cell, but within an entire system, within an entire organism as well. Feedback mechanisms we've touched on real briefly, but we'll just come back to. We have two types of feedback. We have negative feedback, um, which you can also think of as balancing feedback. And balancing feedback sh serves to um, either slow down or stop a reaction, stop a process. So in looking at this diagram over here, we have this um, metabolic chain reaction of events, right? It's not usual, it's not often that A produces B and that's the end of it. We often have several steps in our pathway and that gives us more room and more flexibility to regulate that entire pathway. So in this example here, we have enzyme, we have this um, first set of reactants which are inter interacting with enzyme 1 to produce product B, product B interacts with enzyme 2 to produce C, C interacts with enzyme 3 to produce D. I, stop for a minute right there and think about why are we talking about enzymes here? Why is that a really key part of this, this diagram? If we recall back, enzymes, the role of an enzyme is to speed up a chemical reaction. They put the different substrates, the different reactants, in a favorable position so that bonds can be made or bonds can be broken with less energy than if they were just randomly bouncing around the cell and happened to collide with each other. It produces a more favorable condition. So enzymes are going to be a key part. And, and in changing those enzymes and in regulating those enzymes, we can also regulate a system. In this case here, the products that are being produced in this final step, product D, Okay. An excess of product D is going to block, is going to provide negative feedback and stop this from happening right here. And if I can stop this metabolic process from happening here, that's negative feedback, and then I'm not wasting time developing and producing a product that I don't really need. The opposite of our negative feedback is positive feedback. Okay. Positive feedback can also be thought as reinforcing feedback. It keeps the chemical reaction going. So in this case, reactants W produce X, X produces Y, Y through chemical reaction produces Z. Z in this case could be like a cofactor for an enzyme, it could be a coenzyme, and it's going to serve to enhance the reaction, to keep that reaction going. We'll come back to these a lot more when we start talking about things um, and hormones in the body. So this is just, again, just to introduce you to some of the concepts you're going to see a little bit more um, deeply later on in the course. Well, that concludes our discussion of Chapter 1. I hope you found it useful. Again, don't get frustrated that we're just touching on a lot of topics here. Really, this is just the foundation of what AP Biology will be built on this year. So all of these little topics that we've just now hinted at, we're going to go into a lot more detail throughout the course of the year. It just helps right in the beginning to get a sense of scope of where we will be going throughout the course. If any of the vocabulary that I used during this opening vodcast was unfamiliar to you, now's a good chance to go back and look up those words because we're going to start and build from the vocabulary you should remember from your first year biology course. We're going to build to it and add to it now. So again, if any of that vocab is unfamiliar, take the time now to go and look up those, those terms. Thanks, and I'll see you on our next podcast.